Hello, I'm Alma Angeles and you're watching Eagle News International. Good evening, CJ. Good evening, Alma, and good evening to everyone. Following the news, here are the headlines tonight. At least two people died Wednesday as howling winds and huge waves slammed eastern India in the COVID-stricken country's second cyclone in as many weeks. A Singapore registered container ship is engulfed in flames near Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, after a chemical explosion. The Okta Research Group recommended an extension of the general community quarantine in the national capital region and its neighboring province for two more weeks. And stargazers across the Pacific Rim will cast their eyes skyward on Wednesday night to witness a rare super blood moon as the heavens align to bring an extra spectacular lunar eclipse. First to India, where at least two people died as howling winds and huge waves slammed the eastern part of the country in the COVID-stricken country's second cyclone in as many weeks. Take a look. I Cyclones happen regularly in the northern Indian Ocean, but many scientists say they are becoming more frequent and severe as climate change warms the sea. Last week, Cyclone Tokte claimed at least 155 lives, including dozens of oil rig workers, as it lashed western India, the fiercest to hit the area in several decades. Now, Cyclone Yaz has forced the evacuation of more than 1.5 million people in the eastern states of West Bengal and Odisha, killing so far two people. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee said that the seaside town of Diga has been swamped by waves the height of a double-decker bus. She also said that two people had been killed, including one dragged into the sea by the waves in Diga and another crushed when his house collapsed. Nearly 20,000 houses were damaged and more than a dozen river islands were flooded with a number of embankments breach. The storm pack lashing rain and winds gusting up to 155 kilometers per hour, the equivalent to a Category 2 hurricane. In other news, the Sri Lanka Navy said a Singapore registered container ship is engulfed in flames near Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, after a chemical explosion. The 25 member crew of MV Express Pearl were evacuated safely, with one member hospitalized with minor injuries. Wednesday is the sixth day the fire has been burning. Sri Lankan officials are now preparing for an environmental incident as the vessel has lost containers overboard, taken on a list, and the fire continues out of control. The Express Pearl was carrying approximately 300 tons of bunker fuel, although some of it has been removed from the ship. Officials, however, are prepared with chemical dispersants and booms should an oil leak occur. They estimate that there are 100 tons of fuel on the vessel. 
The Express Pearl is a new feeder vessel delivered to her owners in February 2021. She was completing a voyage from Qatar and the UAE with stops in India and Sri Lanka before her scheduled arrival in Singapore. The vessel's 25-member crew includes Philippine, Chinese, Indian and Russian nationals. And we're still following the developments on the eruption of a volcano in the Democratic Republic of Congo's Goma district, where the UN Children's Fund or UNICEF said hundreds of children are still feared missing and thousands of people have already fled their homes after Mount Niarongongo volcano erupted. Take a look. According to authorities, 32 people died in incidents linked to the eruption, including seven people killed by lava and five asphyxiated by gases. Led by the Red Cross, a significant effort is underway to reunite several hundred children who were separated from their families as they fled. Two villages on Goma's northern tip were destroyed and two others were almost completely covered by lava. Our staff heard testimonies from families who lost their homes and from others who lost children and other loved ones. Entire neighborhoods have been left without electricity and their fears of water shortages. The road leading to northern parts of North Kivu province is also damaged by lava, which will hamper the transport of food and goods to the area of Ambeni, where some 280,000 people displaced by conflict and insecurity since January 2021 rely on humanitarian aid. Funding is urgently needed to help us assist those affected. UNHCR has received just 17% of the 204.8 million United States dollars needed for our operations in the DRC. This latest disaster comes on top of the over 2 million people already displaced by brutal violence in North Kivu province, of which Goma is the capital. This year alone, 450,000 people have been forced to flee their homes. In another development today, powerful aftershocks from the uh, volcano rocked the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo city of Goma today as the death toll from the disaster climbed to 32 now and thousands are still feared homeless. Three days after Africa's most active volcano roared back into life, spewing lava that reached the outskirts of the city of 1.5 million people, tremors were shaking the region every 10 to 15 minutes and two major cracks running up to several hundred meters in length and dozens of centimeters, roughly two feet in width in some places, opened up near the city's main hospital and on a major highway near the airport, worrying residents who have only just returned home after Saturday's eruption. Across the nearby border, the Rwanda Seismic Monitor said it had detected dozens of aftershocks, including a 5.3 magnitude earthquake in the region at 0903 GMT, as well as a 4.6 magnitude tremor on hour earlier. An official of the Goma Volcanology Institute, Celestine Casareca Mahinda, said more damage could be expected even while the tremors are abating. Now here in the Philippines, where the Philippine National Police Chief General Guillermo Eliazar invoked his subpoena power in running after those behind the alleged sale of coronavirus or COVID-19 vaccines and vaccination slots. Take a look. In order to further ferret out the truth on this controversy, I'm invoking my power given to me by the law as the Chief PNP to issue subpoena against the persons involved in the alleged sale of COVID vaccines and vaccine slots. At least isang tao na ang kilala ng PNP na sangkot dito, kaya ang tamang gawin niya ay pumunta sa aking opisina o sa inumang police station upang magbigay ng linaw sa isyong ito. Huwag ka nang makipaglaro ng taguan sa ating mga kapulisan. Hindi katanggap-tanggap ang ganitong uri ng gawain. Reports said a certain Norman Rabaya, who was allegedly offered a vaccination slot by the suspect for a fee, has already submitted his sworn statement to the Mandaluyong police regarding the incident. Rabaya said he became suspicious after learning that the vaccination slot offered to him is in Mandaluyong when he is a resident of Las Piñas. 
Under Republic Act 10973, the PNP Chief, Deputy Director for Administration and CIDG Chief have the authority to issue subpoenas in relation to the police's conduct of investigations, particularly on high-profile crimes. And staying in the country, the Okta Research Group today recommended an extension of the general community quarantine in the National Capital Region and its neighboring province for two more weeks. In an online media forum, Okta Research Group fellow Professor Guido David said, the numbers are still high despite a decline in the average of new COVID cases per day was seen in NCR, Bulacan, Cavite, Laguna, and Rizal. He, however, suggested the relaxation of some heightened restrictions to allow more businesses to operate at a higher capacity. In its latest monitoring report, the group showed that NCR's average of new COVID cases per day is 1,099 over the past week. It also noted the figure is 80% lower compared to its peak in April when the infection surged. New quarantine classifications for June are expected to be announced this week. The Philippines, which is one of the worst COVID outbreaks in Southeast Asia has tallied 1.19 million cases, including 20,169 deaths. Thousands of Australian sports fans were told to self-isolate and get tested for coronavirus Wednesday after an infected spectator attended a match in Melbourne and the city raced to avoid another lockdown. In or Australia's second biggest city is scrambling to contain a growing COVID outbreak with 15 cases identified so far. That includes one Australian rules football fan who attended the clash between Collingwood and Port Adelaide, which drew a crowd of more than 23,000 to the famed Melbourne cricket ground on Sunday. The AFL said thousands of fans who sat near the positive case were now required to self-isolate until they received a negative test. While health officials were reviewing CCTV to determine if others had been at risk. AFL games scheduled in Melbourne for the coming weekend are currently allowed to go ahead with fans at uh, up to 85% capacity. But government officials warned public events could yet face fresh restrictions. Meanwhile, South Korea today announced that people who have received the first dose of their COVID vaccine will no longer be required to wear masks outdoors this starting in July. Yonhap News Agency said health authorities said those who are vaccinated will be partly exempted from wearing masks and other virus restrictions in an effort to encourage more people to get their jabs. Starting next month, those who have received the first dose will also be exempt from gathering from the gathering ban of eight among direct family members and have access to community and welfare centers for seniors with fewer restrictions. Starting in July, those who have received their first vaccine jabs can go outdoors without masks and they will be exempted from capacity limits at religious facilities. According to the news agency, Yonhap News Agency, religious facilities in the greater Seoul area are currently restricted from accepting more than 20% of their full sitting capacity, while those in other regions maintain a 30% ceiling. Meanwhile, a Japanese fishing boat collided with a Russian ship off the northern island of Hokkaido on Wednesday, killing three crew members, according to Tokyo. Japan's Coast Guard was informed that five crew members from the fishing boat were recovered by a Russian cargo ship, government spokesman Katsunobu Kato told reporters. Japan and Russia are locked in a sovereignty dispute over four islands administered by Moscow, which refers to them as the Southern Kurils. Tokyo claims the islands, which it calls the Northern Territories, and the dispute has uh, prevented the two countries from signing a formal peace treaty since World War II.
Fishing vessels in the area have sometimes been involved in tensions. In 2019, Russian detained 24 Japanese fishermen and their vessels, accusing them of exceeding a quota on octopus catches. Back here in the country, a trainer aircraft piloted by a student pilot crash landed at Barangay Urayong Bayan in Bawang La Union on Wednesday. This according to the Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines. The Technam P-2010 aircraft with registry number RPCA-230 was piloted by a 25-year-old student from First Aviation Academy or FAA in Subic Bay International Airport. The student pilot was conducting a solo cross-country flight according to CAAP. The flight originated from Iba Airport in the province of Zambales, en route to La Union Airport and Lingayan Airport, then back to Iba Airport. CAP spokesperson Eric Apolonio told the Philippine News Agency they are waiting for further details from their investigation team. He, however, confirmed that the student pilot's body was already recovered. Investigators would also try to put together the aircraft debris to find out what happened. He said there is no black box since it's just a small aircraft, so radio communication would be looked at and investigators would also collect the debris. In other news, a defiant President Alexander Lukashenko on Wednesday defended Belarus's diversion of a European flight and arrest of a dissident on board, lashing out at critics at home and abroad. In his first public statement since the Ryanair flight was diverted and opposition journalist Roman Protas Protasevich arrested on Sunday, Lukashenko dismissed the international outcry the incident provoked. Take a look. As we predicted, our unfavorable citizens abroad and inside the country changed the methods of attack on the government. They stopped a number of red lines, they passed the borders of sound sense and human morality. Я был задержан сотрудниками МВД в национальном аэропорту Минск. Сейчас я нахожусь в сезон номер один города Минска. Могу заявить, что никаких проблем со здоровьем, в том числе с сердцем или с какими-либо другими органами, у меня нет. Lukashenko, often dubbed Europe's last dictator, is facing some of the strongest international pressure of his 26-year rule of ex-Soviet Belarus. Protasevich, the 26-year-old co-founder of opposition telegram channel Nexta, and his Russian girlfriend Sofia Zapega were arrested after the plane landed. Protasevich, who had been living between Poland and Lithuania, appeared in a video on Monday in which he confessed to helping to organize mass unrest, a charge that could land him in jail for 15 years. Sofega, a 23-year-old law student at the European Humanities University in Lithuania, appeared in another video on Tuesday, saying she worked for a telegram channel that disclosed information about Belarusian police. CJ and I will be back right after this short break. Take a look. Manda na kayo dahil this is gonna be an exciting battle para sa ating monthly finalist. This is Tagisan ng Galing Part 2 Singing Edition. This program is supported by China Bank. Your success is our business. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood.
sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back. Long dismissed as a cookie conspiracy theory favored by the far right. The idea that COVID emerged from a lab leak in Wuhan has been gaining increasing momentum in the U.S. Take a look. As I've said many times, uh, many of us feel that it is more likely that this is a natural occurrence as has happened with SARS-CoV-1, where it goes from an animal reservoir to a human. But we don't know 100% the answer to that. And since this is a question that keeps being asked, we feel strongly, all of us, that we should continue with the investigation and go to the next phase of the investigation that the WHO has done. So because we don't know 100% what the origin is, it's imperative that we look and we do an investigation. Let me just close up by saying it is our position that we need to get to the bottom of this and we need a completely transparent process from China. We need the WHO to assist in that matter. We don't feel like we have that now. We need to get to the bottom of this, whatever the answer may be. Um, and that's a critical priority for us. Previous coronavirus that crossed over to humans, SARS and MERS were quickly traced back to civets and camels. A long-delayed report by a team of experts dispatched by the WHO to Wuhan and their Chinese counterparts drew no firm conclusions on the origins of the pandemic. Citing a U.S. intelligence report, the Wall Street Journal earlier reported that a trio from the Wuhan Institute of Virology were hospitalized with a seasonal illness in November 2019. China disclosed the existence of an outbreak of pneumonia cases in Wuhan to the WHO on December 31, 2019. Now Beijing dismissed the journal report as totally untrue. The virus has already claimed more than 3.4 million lives worldwide and determining how it passed to humans is considered crucial in preventing the next pandemic. Meanwhile, China accuses the U.S. of spreading conspiracy theories and disinformation as the theory resurfaced that the coronavirus emerged from a Wuhan laboratory while urging Washington to open its virology facilities to scrutiny. Take a look. They have a lot of information that they have been able to explain the information and the information that they have been able to explain. 科学精神和研究成果的极大不尊重，更是对全球团结抗疫努力的亵渎和破坏。the Wuhan Institute of Virology has returned to the spotlight after a report in the Wall Street Journal citing U.S. intelligence said three lab workers there were hospitalized in November 2019 with coronavirus-like symptoms a month before the pandemic's first declared case. The newspaper also said researchers had collected samples seven years earlier from a mine in southwestern China where miners had contracted a mysterious illness from a new bat-borne coronavirus. In other news, Taiwan President Chai Ing-wen accused China of interfering in efforts to obtain COVID vaccines from German manufacturer BioNTech. President Chai made the comments while speaking at the ruling Democratic Progressive Party or DPP Central Standing Committee members meeting held online. Take a look. <laughs> BNT,我们都积极地接下采购,也顺利地订购到英美的这两支疫苗。
Back in February, Taiwanese officials previously hinted China was causing difficulties, but officials steered clear of explicitly naming Beijing. China regards democratic and self-ruled Taiwan as its own territory and works to keep the island diplomatically isolated. Taiwan is currently locked out of the World Health Organization and its annual health summit, which is meeting this week. Pfizer BioNTech's distributor for the greater China region, which includes Taiwan, is Fosun Pharma, based in Shanghai. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian on Wednesday said Taiwan's access to vaccines from the mainland is smooth without elaborating further. He also included a swipe at uh, President Tsai. He said we don't recognize this so-called president. She is only the leader of a region of China. Unquote. In other news, Syria's Bashar al-Assad said Western criticism of Wednesday's presidential election has zero value as he cast his ballot in Damascus suburb. Comment, commenting on U.S. and EU criticism branding the vote neither free nor fair. Take a look. I think they were very pleased with the time we spent together. It was mostly personal. We spent a long time. I guess and uh, those of you who've been through personal loss know that although every anniversary is uh, your happy people remember, it also brings everything back immediately. Like it happens that day, it takes a lot of courage to go through it. And they've been wonderful, and I've spoken with uh, the negotiators. I'm hopeful that sometime after Memorial Day, we'll have an agreement. Uh, on, uh, the, on the George Floyd legislation. Um, being here today is an honor, you know, to meet with the president and the vice president and for them to show their concern to our family and uh, for them to actually give an ear to our concerns. Eagle News will be back with more updates. Please don't go away. Sila ang mga kinikilalang bayaning may mahalagang papel para magkamit ang kalayaan at pagbabago sa Pilipinas. Pero sa panahong ito, may mga bagong bayaning nakikipaglaban sa sakit ganap sa buong daigdig ang COVID-19. Ang ating mga frontliner, gaya ng healthcare workers, mga doktor, nurses, medical technologists, at iba pang health professionals, mga pulis, sundalo, security guards, mga tauhan na nangangalaga sa seguridad at mahalagang pangangailangan ng bawat komunidad. Ang mga bagong bayani, ating pasalamatan. Kilalani ang kanilang sakripisyo at serbisyo para sa lahat. Samahan si na Wedge Kujamat. Ito ang balitang panggising sa ulo ng mga balita. Apple David. Sa anim na pong katao ang isinugod sa ospital. Phoebe Publico. Economic sabotage, ang mga tiwaling negosyante. At Cristel Fesalbon. Pag preso ng gulay, makakausap natin. Para iatid sa inyo ang mga kaganapan at pangyayari sa bansa at sa iba't ibang panig ng mundo. Mga napapanawang isyo ng bayan. May balitang sports, entertainment at iba pang kaalaman. Simula lunes hanggang biyernes, alas 5 ng umaga sa paborito niyong morning show, Pambansang Almusal, dito sa Net25. Broadcast journalist Wang De La Fuente returns on Philippine television and radio to deliver top stories and engage with the country's policy makers, shapers, and movers. Tatalakayin ang mga pangunahing balita alas 7 ng umaga mula lunes hanggang biyernes 
live sa Teleradyo ng Net25 at Radyo Aguila DCEC 1062 kasama si Weng De La Fuente sa Balit Palakayan! Welcome back to the news. The family of George Floyd were in Washington on Tuesday to meet President Joe Biden and appeal for sweeping police reform on the anniversary of Floyd's murder by a white officer. Take a look. I think they were very pleased with the time we spent together. It was mostly personal. We spent a long time, I guess a couple hours. And uh, those who even through personal laws know that although every anniversary is uh, your happy people remember, it also brings everything back immediately. Like it happens that day, it takes a lot of courage to go through it. And they've been wonderful. And I've spoken with uh, the negotiators. I'm hopeful that sometime after Memorial Day, we'll have an agreement uh, on, uh, the, on the George Floyd legislation. Um, being here today, It's an honor, you know, to meet with the president and the vice president and for them to show their concern to our family and uh, for them to actually give an ear to our concerns. The president and Kamala Harris, America's first female and first black vice president, hosted several of Floyd's relatives in the Oval Office after the family spoke to top lawyers hoping for progress on police reform. The legislation being considered to increase police accountability would be named after Floyd, who is complicated after being pinned down under the name of Minneapolis officer or police officer Derek Chauvin on May 25, 2020. Floyd's death sparked protests against racial injustice and police brutality across a country already crackling with tension from the election battle between Biden and Donald Trump. Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes as he passed out and died, is to be sentenced in June for murder and manslaughter. In other news, Sirius Bashar al-Assad said Western criticism of Wednesday's presidential election has zero value as he cast his ballot in a Damascus suburb. Commenting on U.S. and EU criticism, branding the vote neither free nor fair, this is what he said. <laughs> الحراك الذي رأيناه خلال الأسابيع الماضية كان الرد الكافي والواضح على كل هؤلاء وهو يقول لهم قيمة آراءكم هي صفر وقيمتكم عشرة أصفر Voting is being held only in government-controlled areas and the U.S. and the EU said Tuesday the election was neither free nor fair. The vote is the second election since the start of a decade-long civil war that has killed more than 388,000 people and displaced half the pre-war population. With opponents abroad barred from standing and no voting in the swathes of territory outside government control, Assad faces two virtually unknown challengers. Now, star gazers across the Pacific Rim will cast their eyes skyward on Wednesday night to witness a rare super blood moon as the heavens align to bring an extra spectacular lunar eclipse. The first total lunar eclipse in two years will happen at the same time as the moon is closest to Earth in what astronomers say will be a once in a decade show. If the skies are clear, anyone living in the Pacific between Australia and the central United States will be able to see an enormous bright orangey red moon. The main event will be between 11.11 to 11.25 GMT late evening in Sydney and pre-dawn in Los Angeles, 
when the moon will be entirely in the Earth's shadow. The moon will darken and turn red, a result of sunlight refracting off the Earth's rim onto the lunar surface, basking our satellite in a sunrise or sunset-tinged glow. Unlike a solar eclipse, the phenomenon will be safely visible to the naked eye. This eclipse will be different because it happens during a supermoon when the moon passes a mere 360,000 kilometers or 225,000 miles from Earth. At that point, it can appear 30% brighter and 14% larger than it is at its uh, farthest point, a difference of around 50,000 kilometers or 30,000 miles. The Philippine food service sector is asking the government for tax holidays, additional 20% indoor dine-in capacity for the vaccinated population, and other relief measures as restaurants continue to face challenges amid the pandemic. During a Senate hearing, Restaurant Owners of the Philippines, or Resto PH, President Eric Tang said they have reached out to legislators to push an initiative granting the restaurateurs tax holidays. Take a look. We uh, are requesting for tax holidays for our landlords uh, so that they themselves can continue extending uh, rent reprieve and rent support to their tenants. Uh, we are asking for tax holidays for our FNB members so that we can reinvest in our own business and hire people back. Uh, we are requesting for a uh, for uh, the P uh, PWD cards and senior citizens card discount to be deductible against our taxes because currently that 20% is absorbed fully by the business operator. We are also requesting the farmers and the food producers have unhindered access to markets. We, um, one of our earliest projects in Resto PH was to help the Department of Agriculture uh, resolve a lot of excess vegetables we were which were just being thrown away. And for the farmers, a lost harvest means a loss of livelihood completely. Uh, and the uh, loss of restaurant operations really hurt a lot of the farmers. It's, it's a very difficult situation for many of us, but we're hopeful that by third quarter, with the uh, policy uh, changes that we, we are asking from government, and uh, we hope that they can be granted, uh, we can function better, especially with the Makuna badge. We've always said that our version of the vaccine pass is not a door to keep people out. It's a key to bring people in. Uh, saying that our version is discriminatory is like saying um, a senior citizen's card is discriminatory against young people. We're uh -huh. not excluding customers from coming into our restaurant, whether they're vaccinated or not. But for now, the 65-year-old are discriminated against because they're yeah, not allowed. They're to not allowed. Uh -huh. So what we're hoping is that if government limits us to 20% to grant us another 20% for the vaccinated, we're not taking it away from anyone, whether they're vaccinated or not. We just want additional capacity for the vaccinated so that we can uh, hire back our people. We are very happy to share with you with our experiences with our restaurants in other countries where with high vaccination rate, like in the U.S., uh, the restaurants are pretty much normal today. They don't even require masks uh, because they found that vaccinated people uh, have minimal risk of contracting the virus or passing on the virus. We're hopeful that the DOH can adopt this finding or adapt this finding uh, and put this in uh, place for policies, for especially for the FNB sector. In other business news, Hong Kong authorities announced they will allow cruise ships to operate in the city, possibly as early as July, but they will have to adhere to several restrictions. Take a look. There is also a very strong aspiration. Every day, a lot of people ask as well, when can uh, we resume travel? Uh, we have uh, imposed certain requirements or conditions on both uh, the company running this uh, cruise, also on the crew member uh, serving the cruise, as well as the customers, the patrons. Okay? Now, all these requirements are premised on safe and secure sort of uh, environment including um, 
vaccination for including uh, repeated tests. Restrictions on sailing include that the crew and passengers have to be vaccinated and must take a coronavirus PCR test 48 hours prior to boarding, said Secretary Edward Yao. Ships will only be allowed to operate at 50% of capacity. The first cruises to nowhere could be operated by the end of July. In early February 2020, thousands of people were stranded for five days aboard a cruise liner in Hong Kong because of fears some staff may have contracted the coronavirus on a previous voyage and passed it on. We'll be back with more news right after this break. Stay tuned. Innovation. Digital disruption. Globalization. Startups, micro, small and medium enterprises, as well as large corporations, all face interesting challenges in the market today. Peek into the world of exciting opportunities and partnerships to drive growth with the latest business news and information. We are open for business. Your weekly dose of entrepreneurial inspiration to update you on the latest developments in the world of business. Get up close and personal with CEOs and thought leaders to help you discover valuable insights Sharpen your instincts for smart decision-making with the latest markets and economic trends, disruptive ideas, global innovation, social entrepreneurship, and other leading-edge business ideas. Join the conversations to create a more vibrant environment for entrepreneurship. Catch Open for Business from Vision to Action. Officials in Ecuador said that genetic tests had confirmed that a turtle found in 2019 on the Galapagos Island of Fernandina is a member is a member of a species thought to have gone extinct a century ago. Take a look. After two years of investigation, it is confirmed that this individual belongs to the species Cholonoides fantasticus una especie declarada extinta desde 1906. Haber logrado esta confirmación nos da una gran esperanza para continuar con los programas de restauración de las poblaciones de tortugas terrestres de las Islas Galápagos. Geneticists from Yale University in the U.S. compared DNA from the female turtle found two years ago with a sample extracted from a male of the species in 1906. The specimen, which is kept in a museum, had been collected during an expedition by the California Academy of Sciences. The, Chelen, the Chelenoides Fantasticus, typical of Fernandina Island, is one of the 15 species of giant tortoises native to the Galapagos Archipelago. The species of Santa Fe Island and the Abingdoni species of Pinta Island have disappeared. Lonesome George, a member of the species, uh, the Chelendoides Abingdoni, died in 2012 without offspring after refusing to mate in captivity with females of related subspecies. He became an emblem of the Galapagos Island. Now a leader in the sustainable food movement, uh, Chef Bun Lai cooks cicadas uh, to open up conversations about food alternatives that cause less environmental destruction than traditional farming. In the Washington, D.C. area, billions of the cicada nymphs that have been living underground since 2004 have started bursting out of the soil, a rare and remarkable invasion. Cicadas to me aren't food, first of all. 
their memories of childhood in Japan. So in Japan, cicadas um, represent and symbolize uh, summertime. I would be able to eat an insect, but then I really liked it and I had more. I was just like, actually, this is this is quite good. June, okay. But what are you guys doing? And we are joined live by MJ Ricardio to give us some, some showbiz update. Hello, MJ. Yes. Hi, Alma. Good to see Good you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes. Yes. Live here in uh, California. Now, uh, this is great news for uh, all the... Uh, if you have an um, Amazon account, this is great because why Amazon is paying nearly $9 billion for MGM and James Bond. Mm -hmm. Amazon isn't competing with Netflix, so but it is spending billions trying to figure out Hollywood. Uh, maybe uh, 007 can help. So um, the, they made a, a regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. Big tech companies have been eyeing big media's companies for years, but they've never gotten together before. Now it's finally probably happening. Amazon is getting ready to pay $9 billion of MGM Holdings, the Hollywood studio that brings you James Bond and smattering of other stuff like the Pink Panther movies and the Handmaid's Tale TV show. So if you are binging on that, uh, CJ or Alma. Uh -huh. And now, um, if you miss the uh, Billboard Music Awards, okay. and uh, who are the big winners? Well, The Weeknd took home 10 10 awards, including top artists, Pop Smoke won five, including the top new artist and BTS. So if you're like a huge Korean fan, that's your moment right there. there and the go. Bud Bunny it's er earned four and hosted by Nick Jonas. And the ceremony also honored Pink as the icon, Drake as the artist of the decade and Trade the Truth as the change maker. Now, um, this is what you've been waiting for if you're a, a huge fan of Fast and Furious. So called F9 is already out has the international box office sizzling. So the latest installment in Universal's fuel franchise kicked off with a massive 162 million point four in eight markets, including China, Korea and Hong Kong. Those ticket sales easily marked the best start for Hollywood blockbusters since COVID-19 hit. So there, there you have it. And also, um, I mentioned to you the, um, the Guerrero Dos. Tuluyang Laban, uh, it received about um, six nominations. So let us read it to you for the International Film Festival Manhattan Spring 2021 in New York City. And it's happening this weekend. So watch out for that. So the Guerrero Dos is nominated for Jury Feature Global, Best Film Feature Grand Prize Performance, Best Director, Carlo Ortega Cuevas, Best Actress, Mia Suarez, Best Actor. No, th this is really interesting because the two actors are head to head together. Mm -hmm. Best Actor, JC Sabinorio, which is the young actor. And 
Another best actor is Artie Guzman, which is the older actor. So, which is great. You know,、mm-hmm. we have to、uh, give applaud them for this. This is a, this is an amazing development for for Guerrero do Estudio Young Laban.、Mm-hmm. And that's the late, latest、uh, showbiz updates over here in California,、uh, Alma. Thank you very much, MJ, and、uh, congratulations to Guerrero Dos. So proud of them. Thank you very much, MJ, for your time. Always keep safe. Absolutely, MJ Ricardi here, reporting from California. We definitely live in interesting times. Back to you, Alma and CJ. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Well, the stars of France never really left us. They were simply on a break. The cast of the beloved 1990s sitcom about six attractive, straight white New Yorkers with ludicrously giant Manhattan apartments finally reunite Thursday for a much-hyped and long-delayed special. Details are under wraps, but fans can expect a table read of a classic episode, a recreation of the famous Friends. At、uh, Monica and Rachel's apartment, and lots of hugs, tears, and reminiscing. In a sign of the show's enduring appeal, the gang are reportedly pocketing two point five million dollars each for the reunion. We have such a bond from this show. Yes, yes, yes. The first table read. That's the first time I laid eyes on any of you. Everyone. Was- And fans who can't wait to see the next Indiana Jones film can now bid to own his iconic fedora next month, if they have perhaps a cool quarter of a million dollars to spare. The custom-made hat worn by Harrison Ford in the 1984 action classic Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom will go on sale in Hollywood from June 29th, with an estimate of $150,000 to $250,000. Take a look. And they were custom made for Harrison Ford in this role. They didn't just walk in and buy a hat off the shelf. They looked at a hat that they liked. They combined attributes from a few different hats to make what became the Indiana Jones fedora, which is probably now today one of the most recognizable hats in all of movies. We have seen many film artifacts trend on an upward curve over time, where values are appreciating. You know, and, and we can see that very directly. Pieces like stormtrooper helmets that have been sold in the past and sold more recently, you can see that rise in value over time as more people become aware that this type of asset is available as a collectible or as a piece for investment.、Uh, you know, you have more attention on it. That brings more money into the marketplace, and overall prices have trended up over time. Right. We we always advise people to buy things because they love them, but there is an investing side to it as well. We do see a lot of people buying these assets as investments, and it's a very fun place to put your money. You know, as opposed to buying something like a stock where all you've got is a piece of paper, or maybe you've got a digital stock certificate. With something like this, you have a physical asset, and many of our clients are displaying these types of things in their offices, in their home theaters. They'll get it set up in an acrylic showcase, and it becomes a a point of pride. And it- And finally, in our news, International Church Iglesia de Cristo or Church of Christ extends a helping hand through the Fidex Subway Manalo Foundation, donating 1.5 tons of food in the Montreal area. From our ABC Canada bureau, here is Maribel Pintos for the report. International Church Iglesia de Cristo Church of Christ extends a helping hand through the Felix Y Manalo Foundation. And I was there to witness this act of giving. Check this out. Felix Y Manalo Foundation has donated sacks of rice, including food and other necessities, here at the FAMES Center, Philippine Association of Montreal, and the Suburb Center. Hundreds have benefited from this donation drive by the Felix Y Manalo Foundation in commemoration of the birth anniversary of the first Executive Minister of the Iglesia Ni Cristo, Brother Felix Y Manalo. We just conducted an anti-humanity activity intended for our fellow men here in Montreal, Canada, and specifically, we reach out here to the males who are、uh, living in the shelter、uh, called the Maison du Père, and the Church of Christ, along with the Felix Y Manalo Foundation, have extended、uh, their assistance through、uh, food. Uh, donated to them today. We truly believe that、uh, what we're doing 
is with the intention of following God's teaching to love our fellow men and also what the Bible says in Proverbs 327 that whenever we possibly can we should do good to those who need it and during these times of pandemic truly our fellow man is in dire need of uh, foods like these which is why with the help of God through the eagerness of our brethren in the district we were able to come up with uh, more than uh, 1.5 tons of food that we truly believe will uh, be of great help to our fellow men. Well, this Aid for Humanity project that we conducted today is totally remarkable and different when it comes to other uh, previous Aid for Humanity projects because today we are battling the challenge due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are challenges, there are government restrictions that we have to observe and follow. But despite all of these things, maybe because of the zealousness of our brethren and their love for the fellow men, though there is a threat on our health, we are not hindered to continue to pursue our projects for humanitarian causes, primarily for the glory of God and for us to be of help to those who are in need. Aujourd'hui, on en profite pour remercier l'Église du Christ et la Fondation Félix Manolo pour les dons alimentaires qu'ils nous ont apportés. Ça va nous permettre de nourrir quelques, quelques gens qui demeurent avec nous à, à, à l'année longue. Pour pouvoir leur offrir, j'ai demandé des dons plus au niveau déjeuner parce que c'est un peu la problématique ici. Donc, on va pouvoir leur offrir un bon déjeuner pour la première repas de la journée. Eduardo Manalo po, kami po ay nagpapasalamat po sa tulong ninyo. Papasalamat po ako sa bigay ng uh, Iglesia ni Cristo. Binigyan po kami ng rice, tsaka mayroon po kaming uh, grocery. Okay, maraming po. maraming salamat po sa tulong ninyo at malaking tulong po ito sa amin. Kasi marami kaming nawalan ng trabaho dito sa Montreal dahil sa pandemic. Thank you, Mary Quintas from our EBC Canada Bureau. Thank you, CJ. Well, that's it for tonight's broadcast. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Please join us again tomorrow. And uh, at the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. We'll see you back tomorrow. I'm Alma Angeles, and we, we live, live in interesting, interesting times. times.